this is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. Welcome back to the Hard Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lewis, and this is the podcast that helps you win the war on average in your daily life. We're here to help you get the tips, tricks, tools, tactics, whatever you need in order to do hard things so you can level up your life, step up above mediocrity, and overcome average. We want you to have a better life by doing hard things, and to do that, on Mondays, we interview high-performing individuals who have done hard things and live to tell the tale, and we pull insights and action items from their stories and give them to you, the listener, so that way you can do the same thing. So let me tell you about today's guest. Today, I talk with former Navy SEAL, former firefighter, and current father... Ryan Lane. We have an awesome conversation today. He taught me a lot about logistics and the importance of logistics in your daily life, as well as tips on how to be a father and a leader. Just a great conversation. Go ahead and listen up to my talk with Ryan Lane. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Ryan. I am very excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, Well, like I said, I like to ask all my guests the same questions starting out. Uh, Ryan, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? So um, I, I obviously have, I've had a couple of weeks to kind of brainstorm and, and, mm-hmm. and figure it out. And, the, and that's a really hard question for me. I mean, so I, I was in college division one, I uh, went into the SEAL teams. I've been contracting overseas. I've worked as a fireman. And to be honest with you, um, the hardest thing I've ever done is be a uh, parent to four, da- four daughters being a parent wow. I've ever done. And, uh, Go ahead. you know, there's, there's a couple reasons for that. I mean, there's, there's no time off. There's no sick days. You know, they're expecting you to be right all the time, always have the right answer. And it's, it's just, it's not reality. You know, I mean, it, it, it is probably hands down in my experience, the hardest job out there and the hardest thing to do is, is to be a good parent. Wow. I, I have to say, I, I love it when my guests say being a parent and, you know, you're not the only one I've had, you know, financial advisors. I had a, a MLE, MLB baseball player say that was the hardest thing he's done, raise seven kids and, and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I just have to say hats off to parents everywhere because I don't think they get enough credit. But with all your experience, I mean, you've you've, you've had to do some really hard things. Uh, what lessons can you share about being a parent and even more specifically about being a parent during stressful times? Uh, just remember that, you know, life itself, is a, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You don't have a finish line tomorrow. You know, you're going to make lots of uh, detours. You're going to make lots of mistakes. And uh, realizing that it's a marathon and not a sprint is, is practice patience. Develop patience. Um, patience is, is key when dealing with... Uh, with kids. And, uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing I struggle with. I'm not exactly a patient person in the world. Yeah. Um, when I'm at work, it's kind of like, you know, Hey, we're doing this and let's do it. And if somebody is not doing what they're supposed to do, it's, you know, plant a, a boot in their rear end. Right. Right. I, I could definitely see how a lot of men kind of feel that way and maybe not just men, but people who are in the workforce, because in the workforce, problems seem so clear and so obvious. And, and you know, you have this solution. And, uh, you know, I don't have kids, but I can think about just relationships in general where you want some sort of resolution or change. And you can't just say, we need to get there. You have to, like, do things differently. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, one thing I really wanted to ask. So you have, you've done all these amazing things, right? And even in from college, even I think from high school, right? You were, you were doing very well in wrestling in high school. How, yes. how are you able to develop, I guess, the mindset that allowed you to do all these really great things and do them well? Well, it's, it's kind of funny. So a young man reached out to me, uh, I think about two weeks ago now, and he was asking me for some advice on buds. And uh, so I've been meaning to put together a little guide which, which I did. It's just a quick 20 pages for him. And I sent it off to him. And I think that the best thing in there is learn to be stubborn, <laughs> learn to be stubborn and get away from all the 
you know, working out with the music. He's asking me, how, how do I develop mental toughness? And I, I told him, I said, be stubborn and learn to be friends with the pain. And the only way that you can learn to be friends with the pain is when you're working out, get rid of the headphones and stuff. There's, there's no music out there. There's nobody going to be telling you, Hey, that, you know, just keep cranking away. No, you, you have to learn to do that yourself inside of yourself to go ahead and tell yourself, Hey, I'm not quitting no matter what. And you know, that takes a, a certain level of stubbornness. In experiences like that, maybe give us an example of like the mental conversation that you have with yourself. So initially, usually like you're going to realize you're, you might be a little bit in over your head. You know, I, I, I'll, for instance, I'll use wrestling. Yeah. Okay. You might grab onto a guy and you're thinking, holy cow, this guy is quick. He's strong. You know, what am I going to do? You know, and, and this is, this is cranking through your head. And you, initially you might end up in trouble. You know, I mean, you might be fighting off your back, you know, he might be cranking on your arm and you just have to tell yourself, you have to do, just do a reset, calm down, take a deep breath and do a reset. And, and what I'm getting at as far as being stubborn is, Hey, he might be ripping your arm literally out of socket. You, you might feel like your arm is coming out of socket, but if you're stubborn enough to say, you know what, I'm not quitting no matter what, he's going to have to hurt me before I quit. Eventually, you're going to find success. You might not win, but you're going to walk off that mat holding your head high. Well, that's really interesting because it kind of takes, it, it, it takes the focus off of the individual match. I mean, obviously, this is a metaphor for life, but it takes the, the yep. focus off of the individual match. And like what you're saying, how life is this marathon and it kind of focuses on the meta game of saying, hey, I might not win this particular uh, conflict, you could say, but right. because of what I learn here, or what I gain, I'll be more successful later on. That's really fascinating. Right. And, and, and people have to realize in life, every single thing you do, you're going to fail at. You will fail at every single thing you do in life because you're, you're never successful initially. So if you quit every time you fail, you're not going to accomplish it. Wow. That's so true. And it's stupid because like we all, like deep down, we all kind of, I think we all have this instinct that like we know that's true. I mean, we all took baby steps as babies and we fell on our face and such. Right. Why do you think that we kind of move away from being okay with failing? I think it's a product of our upbringing to be to be honest with you we get we eventually start to get taught that failure is a bad thing losing is a bad thing you know this is bad that's bad you're always taught what's bad yeah you need to embrace failure failure is not bad failure is how you learn and uh so one thing i was taught a long time ago when i was wrestling i was really young i can't even remember who taught me but, you know, I used to get real nervous before matches, you know, just like all little kids do, because you're going out there and it's not like it's not like playing baseball or basketball. I mean, you're going out there and and you're making physical contact with somebody and they're roughing you up or you're roughing them up. And it's not a, a very natural thing for right. a little. kid. And uh, they told me, don't worry about the winning and losing. Just go out there and compete. So, you know, what they're, what they're telling you is handle what you're doing in the moment. Don't worry about the outcome. Handle, handle what's going on at that time, at that instance. And if you keep grinding away that way, eventually you're going to be more successful than you are a failure. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's such good advice. Honestly. Um, it makes me think of, uh, I mean, not, not to get religious or anything, but it makes me think of a quote in the Bible where it says like, I can't, I can't quote it exactly, but it basically says like, don't worry about tomorrow because you have enough stuff to worry about today. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. Like, if you really focus on being where you are and, and worrying about what's going on, you won't have to worry about, you know, what's coming and it'll come when it comes. You know what I mean? Right. So. Right. If you're, if you spend your time maximizing your time, it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. That's super good advice. Um, I'm really glad that you brought up 
kind of your up upbringing in general because kind of looking at all the things you've done and all the play, you know all the hard things that you've been able to pit yourself up against and accomplish i was curious about what your your childhood and your upbringing was like cuz like you said i have a belief that that really matters as far as what you do in your life and, and it sets you up. So tell me a little bit more about kind of what it was like growing up. So um, I was born in the Detroit area. And when I was really young, my parents moved out uh, west of Detroit by about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And um, so we're up there in Michigan. It's cold in the wintertime, you know, I mean, you have to get done what you need to get done in the summertime because the wintertime you're, you're cooped up a lot. Yeah. Um, I can remember my dad was a fireman and he grew up uh, down in Detroit. He was born and raised down there in the Detroit area, suburb of Detroit. And uh, he had been drafted during Vietnam. He made the best of it and then uh, got home. And he, he had no intention of being part of anything military or paramilitary or anything like that. His best friend had talked him into, hey, why don't you come test for the fire department? So he did. And then he ended up making that a career. I think he spent um, between the two places he worked, maybe about 35 or more years as a, as a firefighter and a fire chief. Um, but he came from a heavily German and, and English family. And their work ethic is, you know, if the sun's up, you're up and you work until the sun's down. Mm. And I can be remember being uh, five years old. And some people might think this is crazy, but I, I remember him putting me on the tractor because he had other things to do. He would put me on the tractor and it it wasn't the biggest tractor, but it wasn't small either. It had a, a five foot woods mower on the back. Being five years old and him uh, engaging the clutch and I'd go out there and drive around and, and mow the yard while he was doing other stuff and then come out and, uh, you know, stop it for me. Yeah. So. Wow. That, that that's so fascinating to me uh i think people don't give kids enough credit i mean i heard a story of uh a kid he was uh, he lived in somalia he got separated from his family and he was able to reunite with his family all alone as a 14 year old and i think of the 14 year olds i know and i'm like there's no they would die like there's no way <laughs> <laughs> but i so. you know i don't know i mean uh even my mom's family she, they were kind of the same way i mean it was expected that you you get up you work you do what you have to do um you know they all went through the great depression um some of her great some of my great uncles some of my, my mom's uncles spent time in the uh, ccc camps you know when there wasn't any work available and stuff like that so um a little bit different perspective maybe than what people are used to nowadays right kind of a curiosity i mean as a parent and I'm, I'm a prospective parent. So this is something that I, I think about all the time. How can you teach your children like a good work ethic without being quote unquote crazy, you know? <laughs> well, it's, that's not an easy answer because I'm still working on that one. <laughs> <laughs> my, my biggest thing is getting them to pick up after themselves, uh, giving them chores. Um, you know, I, I complain to my wife sometimes about it. She probably thinks I'm a little bit too vocal on it, but I, I am I am really big on getting up and making your bed and uh, and making sure that you have your clothes set out or at least your closet is organized enough to where you can walk in there and you can pull clothes off and, and, and have an outfit on for three minutes. You know, I mean, yeah. I, a lot of people, and I get after my daughters for this, they don't keep their organized very well. And I, in fact, I was talking to him last week about it. And I, I use this example. If you go to your closet and you have it organized, you can pull out your, what you need for school and have it on and be dressed in about three, three to five minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have to look around for it, you're probably spending 10 to 15 minutes looking for an outfit, you know? So let's say you waste 10 minutes a day, just doing that and looking for other stuff because you're disorganized. That's like 70 minutes a week. I think it works out to like 60 hours, just over 60 hours a year. If you lived 80 year, you're literally spending like two, you know, almost an entire year of your life looking for stuff. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So, 
Yeah, it's, it's, I try to instill pr- productivity in them and how to stay organized. Yeah. It's a big thing. I don't think people think enough about how you save time so much when things are organized, even things that may not seem directly related to what you're doing. Like, for example, a lot of us work at home, we have desks. Uh, but I believe that, you know, if your desk is clean, you can focus way more on the tasks you have at hand. And so I, I completely agree. Absolutely. And I'm, I mean, I, I personally, I even take that one step further. Like my, my day is organized. It's not organized the hour of the minute. Right. I have lots of time. Like I have a morning session, like uh, five to nine day session, nine to five, and then evening five to nine. And so I, I run basically like three notebooks. I have uh, one is my, like my daily notebook. And I don't, I don't go out and spend like 20 bucks plan or anything. I have like these, I usually have like surplus notebooks that my daughter's bought for school. So some of them might be pink, you know, right. But, right. <laughs> but they're like 25 cents, you know, 50 cents. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> one, one is my daily schedule. So I have like what I'm going to do for exercise. Um, what, you know, what my diet is, what I need to accomplish, what I want to read. Um, all of that in there. And then I have one that's basically just my goals notebook. It has my goals in the first page, long-term and everything. I have dates on there when I want to get, get them done stuff that I've, you know, what my long-term like vision is. And then uh, in the back of it, I have quotes. So what I'll do is I'll wake up in the morning. I fill out my daily schedule. I'll look at, uh, look at what my goals are. And I review my goals every morning just to make sure I'm staying on track. And then I'll flip back to the back, I'll look at and read one quote, you know, I'll read one quote. And then the last notebook is just like a, if there anything major happened during the day that was a screw up, I write it down and I kind of review it in the third notebook as far as what I can do to correct. Wow. When did you create that morning routine? Uh, I've been doing it now for probably about 20 years maybe more. Jeez. Um, I don't, and you know, don't get me wrong. I don't always stick to it. You have to be flexible with kids and stuff, you know, stuff <laughs> comes up. Yeah. Um, when I'm at work, I'm really, really strict about it, but, uh, you, you have to be flexible. But one thing I am, uh, really anal about is people warm up to go work out and stuff. I, I find I operate better if I also warm up before I get my day started. So what I'm talking about is like, okay, let's say you have an hour commute and you have to be at work at eight o'clock. That means you need to probably leave your house. Oh, say six forty, six forty five to give you a little bit of fudge factor in case you don't run into traffic or whatever. Right. So you need, let's say it takes you like uh, 30 to 45 minutes to get ready. So by six o'clock or so, or shortly there, before you need to be getting ready. Well, what I do is I wake up at, I would wake up at five. So what I do is that whole hour before I'm getting my coffee, you know, I'm getting my breakfast, uh, watch the news, maybe read a little bit, um, you know, make my bed, weigh myself, weigh, weighing myself every morning is a really big one. It holds you accountable, keeps you from turning into a slob, you know, Amen. Uh, <laughs> I, I think slobs are notorious with not being productive. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one thing to kind of keep yourself out of, out of being a slob. Um, but that's, that's huge for me is I need to warm up before I get my day going. I know a lot of people, they kind of hop out of bed and bam, they're, they're moving and going. And I think when you do that, the brain's not like really locked in and you tend to miss things, yeah. you know, yeah. you're not, you're not performing at a high function at that time. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Have you ever uh, read or heard about the book uh, Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, I think it is? I have not, no. Oh my gosh. It's it's like exactly what you're doing. It's so funny. He's made like this whole book line <laughs> series about it, like Miracle Morning for Real Estate Agents and Miracle, Miracle Morning for Teenagers, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's fascinating yeah. how similar it is to your morning routine. Well, he must be really smart then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, great minds think alike, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask, kind of going back to your, your history and your timeline, your 
a collegiate, a collegiate athlete, at what point did you decide maybe the military is the way I should go? So I went to Eastern Michigan, which was the, the closest division one school to where I grew up. It, it's actually very close to the university of Michigan. And, uh, about halfway through that first year, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm not digging this. I don't think this is the direction I want to go. Um, and I was kind of lost at that point. And my dad was like, Hey, why don't you go into the fire Academy? You know, you can get a job, come home. You can get a job, go through the fire Academy, go through EMT. You there? Yeah, sorry, I had a I had a call coming in. Sorry oh, about that. No, no sweat, no sweat. Like I said, so, super free flowing, so no sweat. Yeah. So anyway, so I went ahead and did that, and then um, at that time, I mean, I'm like 19 years old, and uh, not a lot of places hiring 19 year old kids. You know, a lot of competition. Yeah. Uh, job right up in Michigan. I mean, they have been for quite some time. Uh, econ- not super great up there with the auto industry thing. So then I was, you know what? Um, I was working as a fireman, you know, paid on call uh, in the town I grew up and uh, doing some other stuff. And then I was like, you know what? Uh, I think I'll take a look at the military. And and I figured, you know, if I'm going to go in the military, I might as well, I might as well challenge myself, you know, I mean, you know, really try something tough. So that's, that's when I decided to go in. Wow. That's super interesting. A lot of people I've talked to, I mean, they consider the military, but um, very few end up getting to to where they want to be. You know what I mean? And I, I guess the question I have is, what do you think was different about you than about other people that might have set out with the same goal? Um, I think honestly is that... Uh... I, I was not raised to quit at anything. I'm not, you know, that's not in my DNA. Um, quitting is is basically like you might as well be running out in the street and, and outing, you know, bad things about Jesus. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just not. It's not acceptable. Quitting is 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 that is a no, big no go. Wow, that's so, so fascinating. I, I think just that and, and just going in with the attitude of, you know what, no matter what happens, I'm not quitting. I mean, they're going to have to drown me before I quit. Um, I think, in fact, when I got to Bud's, me and another guy, and he made it through too, we went out to the beach. And uh, at that time, the Navy had the regular fleet wore these dungarees, which was basically like a jeans and a jean shirt. They were still wearing that old school stuff. I went out there. I took all my dungarees. I threw them. In, I threw them in a fire pit on the beach, and he did too. And we burned them. <laughs> and I can remember the first inspection I had, and the instructor's like, "Where is your dungarees?" And I said, "I don't need them anymore." <laughs> he said, "What do you? I burn them." <laughs> and he goes, oh, "Well, that's going to be a pricey mistake if you don't make it through." And I said, "Well, I'm, I'm going to make it through." <laughs> wow. Yeah. Have you heard the story of uh, uh, Hernando Cortez as he, you know, he, he's going against, I think it was the, either the Incas or the Aztecs. Yes. Yeah. That's super funny how, well, not funny, but interesting how you have a very similar situation where in, in a sense, you kind of burned your boats and said, Hey, I'm here. Either I go forward or I die. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, I guess it's, you, I guess you could make similarities to, uh, to like the Soviets in World War II, whether you think it's right or not. I mean, they basically threw guys out there and said, hey, if you turn around, we're going to shoot you. Yeah. So you only have one way out of this, and that's to go forward. I think so, the I Romans mean, did something similar. Yeah. If, if, you, uh, if you have no other options, you know, success becomes the only way. Asking is someone who, you know, I, I'm an average person, I'll be honest like, didn't you feel any fear? And like, if so, what did you do about it? Um, you know, there's always doubts. You're always going to have doubts. I mean, the most successful people out there or the most, I shouldn't say successful. I should say accomplished. Um, just cause you accomplish stuff doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. Yeah. Uh, I think they all have doubts to a certain extent. It's just a matter of building that mental toughness 
to shut them down and tell yourself, you know what? No, I'm, I am good enough to do this. And I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do it. Wow. You know, uh, I think it's uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a saying, you know, uh, what is it? Ig- ignore the naysayers. Well, it's, it's true. It, and, and he's not just talking about the naysayers around you. He's, even in your own mind, you know, your own mind's going to be a naysayer, but you just have to say, you know what, I'm, I don't care what happens. I'm, I'm going to do it no matter what. Wow. Have there been any moments where that same mental toughness has really played a huge part and you were kind of surprised, like, wow, I didn't think that would apply in this case. Um, not that I can think of, but I don't, you know, I'm not really thinking about that. <laughs> it's kind of a hard question. I mean, <laughs> if someone asked me, I'd be like, I, I don't know, like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think I'm so conditioned about it anymore that I just don't even really, it's really never crosses my mind anymore. Wow. So if you would, if you were given the task to help just anyone, right? Learn how to condition themselves. Like what, 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 what are like the first two or three things that you would say, do this? The first thing I would say is get yourself organized. You know, if you're, if you're a slob, you cannot accomplish anything. You're not going to accomplish anywhere near what you can if you organize. I mean, that's, that's just a fact. I mean, so, um, and I think I put this on my Instagram too. You know, a lot of people make a big deal about, hey, the military teaches you to fold. They're really anal. They teach you how to make your bed. The reason why they do that is not to instill a level of discipline or pride or anything like that. I mean, that's a byproduct of it. Really, it comes down to one thing. If you're a slob, you're not productive. I mean, if, if you're not taking care of what you need to take care of the first time every time, I mean, how much productivity are they going to get out of you? None. I mean, you know, they have a, a vested interest in you. They have an investment in you. Um, so they need you to perform. Wow. I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the uh, second thing would be is to go ahead and uh, spend time every day during your warm up, actually reading some self-improvement stuff. You know, I think a lot of people have a tendency to doubt themselves you know, and they let other, what other people are saying creep into their head and they start doubting themselves. Once you start doubting yourself, you're not going to accomplish what you're setting out to do. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you really, that's one thing to build mental toughness. You really have to have a solid foundation of believing in yourself. I never even thought about that. I, I like I've never connected mental toughness with betting on yourself. You know, it's yeah. super insightful. Hey, give me a sec. I got to plug this. I got to plug my phone. <laughs> you're totally fine. You're totally fine. I'll say something random and, and totally on point while you're doing that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. All set. Um, so the next question I had in, in looking at your history and, and what you've done, you've had the opportunity to train people uh, in, in foreign nations and, and things like that. And being a leader is something that I think falls to us at least one point in our lifetime. And it's an, it's an important experience, I'd say. So what are the top tips of, of training people, being a leader and, and learning how to lead that you could give to our audience? I think the biggest mistake leaders make is not allowing their people to screw up, micromanaging them, um, being heavy handed. Uh, So I'll use uh, one specific experience that I had uh, last year with a, with a guy who's a young officer in a foreign country. And he was very heavy handed with his people um, he's running a basically a, a basic training program for their their guys, and um, it was a commando course. He's very heavy handed with them, uh, gets physical, yells a lot. So you know, after about a, a let's see, I spent the first two trips kind of just observing and 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 seeing the ground truth and seeing the personalities. So probably about six months total observing this. 
I, I finally pulled him aside and I told him, I said, Hey, do you ever see me yelling at anybody? And he said, no. I said, do you ever see me lay a hand on anybody? And he said, no. And then I grabbed another guy that was a trainer that was training a different program for them. And uh, I brought him over and I said, do you, have you ever seen him hit anybody? He goes, rarely ever. I said, have you ever seen him raise his voice to anybody? He said, rarely ever. I said, let him screw up. That's, that's what they're here for. That's how you learn. You, they have to screw up. The only time you should really be raising your voice is if somebody doesn't, isn't listening repeatedly. And then the only time you should have to get physical with somebody is if you got guys that just aren't cutting it and you tell them to leave and they want to make a issue out of it and try to threaten you, well, then, you know, you beat them to a pulp and you drag them. <laughs> but other than that, there's really no reason for it. It doesn't, it doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't win points with anybody. Um, you're going to have to work with these people later on. And it doesn't motivate anybody at all, really. It, it really doesn't. What motivates people I've found is letting them fail and then sitting them down, going through corrective actions with them and teaching them what they did wrong and then letting them get back up and fail again and, and just do that. And as long as they have a good attitude and they want to learn, that, in my opinion, is the best approach. Wow. I mean, that makes so much sense. I actually had an experience where one of my friends, he was uh, a manager of this, of this team and he was kind of complaining to me and saying like, I can't, like, they need me for everything. And I was like, well, maybe you should go on vacation for a week and then see if they need you, you know, cause obviously if your boss isn't there, you'll figure something out. And I never asked yeah. him what he did, but that's super interesting that you say that. Cause I would have expected something like way different, but that that's just seems so simple, you know? Well, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, you know, but I, I've seen guys that are very highly educated that have been, uh, you know, leading all kinds of things and they micromanage. And it's like, what, what are you doing? You're spending all your time micromanaging and putting out little fires when what you should be doing is just standing back and orchestrating and then stepping in and putting out big fires. Let's let your, let your managers underneath you put out the little fires. You know, and it's uh, so a, a, another example of that is we had another officer that during training, he would run around. This is a company off company level officer. He's running around to his troops and he's saying he's telling them what to do. He's telling them what to do. And I'm like, so after the uh, field training exercise, we pull him aside and I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm leading my troops. I said, no, you need to be standing back and orchestrating and making sure everything's going good. You go ahead and pass orders to your squad leaders and your platoon leaders and let them disseminate, you know? Um, so we kind of went through the span of control thing. And I think a lot of people in the civilian world don't really realize this. Most people, I would say, 99% of people out there are really only capable at any one time under stressful conditions, managing anywhere from three to seven people directly. So if we looked at that, like if you had a general in the U.S. Army and he was running around telling every company officer what to do, when to do it, I mean, could you imagine the fiasco you would have? It, yeah. it would be ridiculous. You know, I mean, it's just not, it's not possible. It's not a, it's not a good use of resources and he would be stressed out and he would be making uh, bad decisions. He would be making mistakes. You know, it's uh, you're as a leader, you need to stand back and you need to be the guy orchestrating and then disseminating information. So like in the military world, like for instance, we're talking about this company officer. So he disseminates to his platoon commander, his platoon commanders disseminate to his squad, to the squad leaders and the squad leaders disseminate directly to the troops. So now he's controlling a hundred plus people by just really dealing with maybe the, uh, you know, two or three platoon leaders and senior NCOs in those platoons 
So at most he's dealing with maybe like uh, five to six people and he's controlling everything that that hundred man element is doing just by dissemination. Wow. Now, I mean, that, that takes a lot of trust, right? So how do you, I guess, how do you learn to trust your subordinates or, or put the right people in the place in their place? You know what I mean? So, you know, that goes back to what we were saying before, you got to let your people fail. The only way that you can actually evaluate your people for leadership roles is to stand back, observe, play the orchestra and let them fail. There's too many people they want to get in the mix and it's like, hey, no, it's, it's not the time to get in the mix. When it's time to get in the mix, you'll know, you'll see it. You're going to have a big fire and you're going to step in and put it out but you have to let your people fail. Otherwise you don't know what they're going to do. You know, you're just picking and choosing. And I, and I've seen it a lot too. I'm sure other people have too, where people just pick people. Oh, Hey, I like that guy. I'm going to put him in charge of this. And it never end. It, it just, just does not end up good. <laughs> that, I mean, it makes sense. Cause that's basically a, a data driven approach to people. You know, you put someone in a position and see if it works out. If it doesn't, you move them to something else you feel it might and constantly testing. Right. Right. So you're, you're constantly analyzing, you're constantly evaluating. That's, that's your, at that point, that's your job. If you're managing uh, people like that, 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 that is management. I mean, analyze, evaluating and, and making a decision. I, I love these podcasts because, you know, things that seem so complex in my mind, just simplify so much when I'm talking to guests like you, Ryan, they just say things that like, Oh no, managing people, you just treat it kind of like analytics in a way. I mean, obviously there's some emotion involved, but you know, you do right. your job and put the people where they need to be. That's, that's so smart. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask as well, in all your experiences, did you learn that specific principle of leadership because of your experiences or did you see maybe some examples of people around you? I think I learned that honestly, um, I think it refined it at, being in the military and being in the fire service. But uh, my first learning of that was probably from my dad. Um, so when I was young, um, when I was in junior high school and uh, early in, in high school itself, um, if they had a major incident where my dad worked, which was like 40 minutes, 45 minutes from the house, uh, we started actually going with him uh, down there. He was uh, the department chief at that time. And just go watch, you know, and, and you would watch these guys make decisions and they, they operate on a very similar. So fire departments and, and police departments operate on a very similar approach to uh, incidents that a military structure does. And uh, just stepping back and watching how a battalion chief or something orchestrates an incident and what he's doing and, and everybody that's involved in it. I mean, there's a lot to really learn there. Um, if, I had one tip to give to a private entity that really wanted to, to train their people right and, and actually learn how to interact and, and motivate their people and get everybody pointed in the right direction is go look at how police departments, fire departments, and the military operate. It's not a, everybody looks at it and they think, oh, it's just, it's mindless, you know, let's, you know, march, 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 hut, hut, hut. It is, it is anything but that. It is very structured. It's very controlled. It, it looks, it might look like chaos, but it, it is not. Wow. That, that's really smart, especially because like a lot of people do have this uh, very Hollywood type idea of how police works, fire works, um, military. And I, I bet that if they went there, it would, it would be very different, especially because, I mean, as I've been talking with you, I've noticed that you are very, uh, at least when you were talking about your morning routine and such, you understood the logistics of it. And I'd imagine that would play a huge part in being a good leader, being understand how to get things where they need to be at the right time. Right. Right. And uh, you know, that's not just being a good leader. That's actually being a good soldier too. I mean, any soldier out there that's worth their salt is going to be good at logistics. I mean, even if it's just looking out for himself, you know, he's looking out, he's, he's got his equipment in order. He's got everything packed. He's getting up at the right time. He's getting himself to where he needs to be at the right time. All of that is 
and that starts with uh, with a good boot camp, you know, uh, in the military. Is they really instill that in people is, you know, logistically being organized. You have to have yourself organized. If you're not organized, you can't lead people. Period. If you're not organized, you're not going to be a good soldier. Period. Wow. I've heard, I've heard so many great things about boot camp. I mean, from all of the branches, well, except Coast Guard. I haven't had the chance to talk to someone from Coast Guard yet, but all the branches I've talked to, they've said, you know, boot camp has really impacted them. For for us civilians, if you could, you know, give us like, I know this is like a lot to ask because it's a, it's a big thing, but like what, besides being organized, obviously, what things would you tell us to practice and, and implement in our daily lives in order to get some of the benefits of going through that experience? Uh, I would say structure your day. So, you know, it's, it's not just about being organized, it's structuring your time. Um, you know, I think a lot of people look at it and think, oh, being organized as far as folding my clothes, you know, uh, you know, ironing my, ironing my clothes, making my bed, all that. No, it's, it's a very structured environment. So every, even down to the most minute detail, and you don't have to be this anal, but they, you call, you go into the chow hall and they're like, Hey, you have 10 minutes to eat and then you need to get out. And it's because they have thousands of people that need to get through there. You know, um, it's so they don't have any time to waste, you know, it's, they have certain goals that they need to meet on that day at this time to ensure that you stay on track for the schedule to get out of there at the time that you need to be out of there. And, you know, it's not just a, Hey, today, no, they're looking, you know, eight weeks from now, they're looking, Hey, okay, this is what they need to hit in order to get out of here. Well, I'm just thinking of how that would apply to a family. And I'm guessing you don't probably sit your girls down and say you have 10 minutes. To no. It's probably a little bit different. <laughs> It's quite a bit different. There's a lot more, there's a lot more leeway. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest. I'm not for anal that way. I'm not the guy going in and inspecting stuff. Now, do I get in their rear end when it, they need it done? Yes. And I don't think my wife really likes it, but I mean, that's just, that's the way it is. I think that's kind of the, the role of a father sometimes. Um, but no, it's a lot more, a lot more subtle, Yeah, you know, a lot more subtle. One other question I wanted to ask, um, and this was one that I, I've, I've always wanted to like, especially improve on myself. How do you function well, perform well under stress? Because based on what I, what I know about you, you've been able to do that consistently. How do you do that? Okay, so the best lesson I learned about stress was when I was working on it as a paid on call firefighter, there was a guy that he's, he's, he was friends with my dad at the time. Um, he worked in the town there. He's a retired Detroit fireman. And uh, he was the first chief that I had uh, that I worked directly for. And he told me one day, I, I said, how do you stay so calm on the radio and stuff? He said, Hey, you have to realize something. When you get to an emergency, you're not the one with the emergency. You know, I mean, who, you know, you're not, you're not the one that has to panic. It's, it has nothing to do with you. You know, I mean, just step back and take a look at things, you know, and, and just be like, you know, Hey, everybody can be yelling, screaming and diving out windows and, and everything else. But, you know, at the end of the day, are you going to make things worse? Even if you stood there, are you making things worse? No, you're not. It's a, it's about as bad as it's probably going to get. So, I mean, there's a lot of, some people might think that's cold, but there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you, if you're running around with your hair on fire, you're not going to solve anything. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like cold, hard truth does way better than fluffy. I mean, even fluffy truth, but like just getting right down to it and understanding things in like a simple way, like, you know, whether I panic or not, like it's still a fire. Right. Right. So. Wow. So, I mean, so for instance, like in, in your mind and, and, and they teach you this at buds to um, when you're dealing with underwater stuff and like you'll do a pool comp or let's say you do drown proofing or something like that. At the end of the day, if you 
go ahead and allow yourself to stress out, you're going to make it 10 times worse. It's, it's going to be 10 times worse than if you just say, you know what, this is what I'm faced with and I'm just going to do the best I can. And if the best I can is not good enough, then that's, you know what, that's just the, the way the chips fall. That's the way it is. Yeah. I feel like we don't, or maybe at least in my life, we don't stress enough, like the, the best you can um, element of things like, it'll work out if you do the best you can. And if, if it doesn't work out, then you might not be here to even worry about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I think that kind of goes back to uh, what we were talking about uh, earlier in the podcast when kids are kind of programmed, Hey, failure is bad. This is bad. That's bad. Mm. You know, no, it's, it's not bad. What's bad is not doing the best that you can quitting before you even start because you're afraid of failure, that's, that's way worse than doing the best you can. Yeah. One other curiosity I had, I, I read all the things that, you know, you've done and I recognize most of them, but one thing that I didn't recognize was a hotshot USFS. What exactly is that? Okay. So um, in between the military and me uh, working for the U.S. government overseas, I worked uh, fire and uh, I did the city stuff. And then I uh, also did wildland. So I, I worked on a hotshot crew for a season out in uh, New Mexico. And that's just a it's just a professional type one crew. They're they're not a throw together crew. They're actually organized, have their own buggies. And you just you travel all over the U.S. during fire season. And, and you know, you're going to big fires and putting them out. You're kind of like the. Uh, kind of like the infantry for, for fires. Wow. Or wildfires. Ha, has there been any wildfires where you get there and, and you kind of feel like there's nothing you can do? Uh, yeah. I mean, it happens. I, I've been on several fires where, you know, they have a big blow up and uh, the winds are really nasty. And when you have a blow up too, uh, sometimes those things will start to drive their own weather to a certain extent. And, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. You just pull back and you just observe. I've, I've been on fires before where we literally just hopped in the buggies and drove back to camp. They pulled everybody off the fire and, and air attack was just up doing circles, which is, which is the air boss. He's controlling all the air assets and everything. He's just doing circles, just kind of seeing, you know, recounting the fire and seeing what's going on. Um, staying outside of the, uh, staying outside of the blow up. Yeah. And actually a, a, a follow-up question on that. Um, how much of firefighting, especially wildfire fighting, is you are actively stop the fire versus you just kind of let it run its course, if that makes sense? Um, I would say when you're, when you're actually going out on a fire, you are spending the vast majority of the time. I mean, they're not sending resources out to a fire unless you're actively engaged in stopping that fire. Now, it doesn't mean that you're cutting hotline, like you're right on the fire cutting line and stuff. Mm -hmm. You might be, um, in fact, I can remember one fire in New Mexico. I had some pictures of it. And uh, I mean, we must've been like three, two or three miles off the fire front. And you, cause the aircraft are really small in the pictures and uh, we're cutting line with a dozer. We're kind of cleaning up the dozer line and, and punching in areas where they didn't want to put a dozer in um, because they had some uh, uh, natural areas that they uh, could not put the dozer in for environmental reasons. Hmm. Um, and we were catching spots out that far also though too and, and lining spots. But so a lot of it is not like the movies where you see, you know, you're, you're fire and you're doing, no, a lot of it's kind of like I would equate it to, um, like a prison chain gang, maybe dig, digging a ditch. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll, they'll burn off that to widen that line out though, so that you're not getting spots across. Mm. And uh, so I, it's, you know, I, you're not, they're not going to spend resources on a fire unless you're actively engaged in trying to control that fire in one way or another. Wow. Well, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Going back to logistics, like, uh, it, it's all a matter of putting the right things in the right place at the right time and organization. So, wow, that's a <laughs> like the whole co podcast conversation right there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they, you know, they, they actually have uh, dedicated crews that do that. They, they have, a lot of people don't realize this. They have management crews 
which are rated like type one, type two, type three, that actually go out on these fires, they deploy on these fires as an actual management crew. So like your safety boss is your safety boss on that, on that management crew, on the, your incident commander is your incident commander. And they are very, very adept and good at logistics. Um, they've, I think they've used them in other capacities. In fact, in other instances besides wildfires, just because of that reason. Wow. That is so fascinating. Logistics just, it, it kind of seems like the key to life right now based, you know, on everything I've heard. So it's definitely something I'm going to need to work on in my personal life. Um, one kind of final question before we wrap up a little bit for someone who is preparing on joining one of these organizations, whether military, fire, police, uh, or, or just an organization that has high standards and they want to prepare, what sort of things would you recommend they do in advance? I, I would recommend getting yourself uh so like I was talking about that three notebook system, mm-hmm. implement that, um, get yourself on a physical training program. Um, the fact of the matter is, even if it's not the most physical job in the world, appearance says a lot. Um, start organizing your day, you know, being on time says a lot. Uh, if you're wanting to go ahead and put your best foot forward and get into one of these organizations, you have to look the part. You have to play the part, which is be on time, be where you're supposed to be, be doing what you're supposed to be doing, um, all of that. Yeah. And uh, you you definitely do that because, you know, I sent you the link for the meeting and you were in it like 15 minutes early. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you, you practice what you preach. Um, well, if you're not 10 minutes early, you're late. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, another just kind of curiosity again before we wrap up. Um, and, you know, we were speaking about Hollywood earlier and how it's kind of uh, changed the way we look at like how firefighters fight fires. Um, as, a, as a a Navy SEAL, how do you view uh, the rise in popular, visible popularity, you could say, of the, the SEAL community in Hollywood movies and things like that? Because I know generally you guys are silent professionals. And so I'm curious to see what your take is on that. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, and I, I had done another podcast before yours and, uh, I won't, you know, I'm not going to put a plug out there or anything. <laughs> right. Um, I, I use this as an example, they had asked a question on what I thought the most, the, the most critical job for special forces and for the U S military, as far as from a national security standpoint, what they can do moving forward. And really the most important thing is not all the Hollywood would glitz and glamour stuff. You see the shootouts, the guys sniping people, the most bang for our buck is actually going out and training foreigners, working with foreign partners. If we don't want to have troops on the ground in all these countries, it's actually getting guys out there that have the ability and the skills to train and work with foreigners and working through the problems that they're facing and assisting them. That's the, that is the best way to move forward in, in, in that environment. Well, it's kind of like what we were talking about with leadership, being able to kind of create a system where they then lead the troops and you don't have to micromanage them, but on a more national scale, if I got that right. Correct. You're on an international scale, you're enabling your partners and you're also working with other partners and, and you're, you're not just teaching them there. You're also learning from them too. And you have a, uh, you know, you're building this cohesiveness amongst yourselves. So later on, like if you had to go into that country for any kind of reason, if you had to bring in conventional troops or anything happened, you know, you, you would be able to do that. You would have that ability because you have built those relationships it's about, it's really about relationship building and enabling our friends. Um, you know, if you, if, if you were in business with a friend, you wouldn't stand there and and just watch them struggle at something. I mean, you know, you have a vested interest financially, not only as a friend, but also financially to to step in. If he's struggling with something that you can help him out with, you help him. Right. I mean, it it only makes sense. So, and you're not going to use all your resources fixing his problems he has to be able to fix his own problems so but if you can enable that you know it's it's in your best interest too yeah wow that that that's super smart i feel like i've learned so many things 
just not even about like personal development or, or doing hard things, but just so many things in general. So thanks. Thanks so much for, for being on the show. I, I you know, uh, but before you go, like I said, a couple of questions. Um, how can people reach out to you, see what, what you're up to and, and support it? Oh, okay. So um, I have an Instagram. I'm not a big social media kind of guy, to be yeah. honest with you. Um, my Instagram is r.lane, L-A-N-E, three. And then uh, my email also is uh, ral204 at hotmail.com. Um, like I said, I have a, a, a Bud's Guide. It's, it's literally 20 pages. So if, if somebody's interested, you know, just, just hit me up. Uh, it's, it's, it's really two, three bucks right in that range. And I send it to them. It, it is, it, it cuts all the fluff out. I mean, I'm not, you know, let's be honest here. I'm not getting, it's like 10 cents or 15 cents per page is what it works out to for them yeah. in about 20 pages. Um, it really, it just goes down through diet, your workout, um, what you need to do. A lot of stuff that we talked about, you know, little tips for getting through buds, some of the evolutions, tips for the evolutions. Um, it's a down and dirty. It's not a, hey, look at me, 200 page book. I mean, it's, it's really like from the first page on, it's all about, hey, what you can do today to get moving towards your goal. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Awesome. I will put those in the show notes. Um, but as far as action items for our audience, I came up with uh, quite the list, but the first one is organize yourself. Second one is institute a morning routine. Did you have a third one that you'd like to add to that? So, uh, yeah, I, I'd written down a couple of them here. Oh, perfect. Think. Yeah. I'd love to hear those too. So, uh, the morning routine and then, uh, the, the, the morning routine, get yourself organized you know, uh, stop making excuses. You know, I mean, honestly, too many people make too many excuses. Um, you know, and, and you see it. Um, so the last one here is don't be making excuses why you don't have time. A lot of people sit on their deathbed saying, Oh, I God, I wish I had more time. Well, a prime example is not being organized. I mean, you can make your own time. I mean, if you get yourself organized, heck, you know, I mean, you, you, ha you have plenty of time in the day. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't work. It's not like we're working 16 to 17 hour days, at least not most people. Some people yeah. do, but most people do not even come close to that. Agreed. Awesome. Thank you so much. I will put those in the show notes. Ryan, I've appreciated this so much. Again, sorry for the mix up before. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thanks for being on my show. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, there is another one for the books. Thanks so much, guys, for listening to this great episode. Uh, Ryan was awesome, wasn't he? Uh, you know what? Go ahead and give him some love on, on social media. Go to his Instagram. Just tell him how much you love the podcast. I know that he would probably appreciate that. Um, but again, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to the, the Hard Thing Podcast. I know that if you do some of the action items that we talked about today, you will see a marked difference in your life. So that's all I got to say about that. If you want to support the podcast, there are a couple things you can do. First thing, make sure you subscribe to the show. Never miss a single episode. We have episodes on Mondays and Thursdays. On Thursdays, we actually come out with our, our Thursday episode called The Forge, where myself and co-host Ty Crockett, we put ourselves in the trenches. So we're going to do the action items that Ryan gave us, and we're going to give each other challenges and try and push ourselves that way as, as an attempt to show you what it's like to do hard things. And then hopefully that inspires you to do the same. So, so go ahead and subscribe. Never miss an episode. Also reach out to me on Instagram at the hard thing podcast. I'd like to see what you're up to. Tell me what you like about the podcast, maybe what you don't like and, and how we can improve. Uh, last but not least, we want to invite you to help us raise some money for a nonprofit. It's called Operation Underground Railroad. What they do is they go undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking, which is a big job, but they've, they've taken it on. So we want to help them and you can go to gofundme.com slash overcoming dash average, donate some money. All, all the money goes straight to OUR and every, every little bit helps. So even just a dollar goes a long way. Um, but go ahead and help us raise $1,000 for them. Thank you guys so much for being with us on the show today. I, I love this. I love having these conversations. I feel like it's making me a better person. And if it's making me a better person, I know for a fact it's making you a better person because I'm like the average of the average. So, you know, thanks so much, guys. I, I promise you, 
you will see change if you do these things. So all you got to do is go out and do hard things because you will overcome average.